Pictures of Hollis Woods, page 37, fourth picture, The Old Man's Mountain. I sat on the porch steps, drawing the mountain, while I waited for Stephen. He was hanging over the motor of the old man's truck, fiddling with the hoses or connections, muttering to himself, if he'd let me drive this thing for half a minute, I'd know exactly what's wrong with it. Half the arguments in that house had to do with Stephen's wanting to drive the truck. Right here on the property, that's all, he'd say. No big deal. The other arguments had to do with his disappearing. It made the old man crazy. Up the mountain road to follow a deer path, lying on the bottom of a rowboat to drift along, searching for the kingfisher, gone somewhere, and dragging me along with him. One night at dinner, the old man had dropped the box in my lap. Tan leather, with dozens of pencils inside, points sharp and perfect, in every color you could imagine. A thick pad of paper, erasers, a pencil sharpener. I had picked up one of those pencils, French blue, a soft color that was almost purple. I love this, I told him. I had wanted to throw my arms around him, wanted to tell him that I'd never had a present like this before. No one had. I wanted to tell him, but didn't tell him. I ducked my head, my bangs, a fringe over my eyes. But he knew. I knew he knew. The old man was an artist, but a different kind. He drew circles and lines and squares that turned into plans for houses and buildings. He said he wished he could do what I did. Now Stephen flew around the side of the truck like one of Izzy's hens, his eyeglasses taped to the side of his head, his hands filthy from the truck. Move it, Hollis Woods, he'd say. We don't have all day here, you know. I put the mountain picture carefully inside the box. At the end of summer, I'd give it to the old man as a present. Don't think about the end of summer, I told myself. Stephen and I raced each other down the road, across the bridge, dead tie, and stopped, out of breath, at the mountain road. After a moment, we started up. Stephen lurched along. At one turn in the road, he was all speed. The next, he'd stop short, bent over, nose almost touching the ground. Look at this, Holly, it's a raccoon print, he'd say, or... See the way this branch is cut off? Beaver, building a den where the stream comes off the mountain. The old man was right about the road. It was slippery, muddy in the shade, one side ready to slide off the mountain straight into the river, but worth it. We're going all the way to the top? I drew in my breath. Did I want to do that? Stand on top of the mountain, a mountain of trouble myself? Stephen shook his head. Pop would have a fit. He ran his hand over an imaginary beard. The rocks fall, Stephen. Use your head, he said in the old man's voice. Halfway up was a spot that widened. We looked down and saw the house and Izzy picking tomatoes, and we whistled at her until she waved, even though she couldn't see us. Then we sank down on a rock, and Stephen fished in his pocket for a squished Hershey bar. Should I give you half, he asked. You're not as big as I am. Give me all, I told him, laughing. I'm more deserving. He held up both pieces, squinting. The old man would say that. I knew that. Somehow, the old man thought I was a great kid. How had that happened? I swallowed, thinking of the lemon lady. You want tough, she had said. I'll show you tough. And something else. I didn't even remember who it was. You missed, half, ha you missed school half the term. How do you think you can get away with all this? But I was a new person with the old man, with Izzy, with Stephen. It was as if the angry Hollis was seeping right out of my bones, leaving chocolate as soft as that sticky Hershey bar. I looked at Stephen, wondering if he minded that the old man thought I was great. But Stephen was splitting the candy bar, and he gave me the bigger piece, but did it quickly. I wasn't supposed to know. I took a breath. I thought about the W picture in my backpack, the mother, the father, the brother, the sister. I don't think of that either, I told myself. Page 41, Chapter 4, The Time with Josie. Company's coming, Josie said. I looked up from my pad. I was drawing a picture of the boat I had seen at Josie's canal, white with thin blue lines of trim, the name in script on the back, Dan Bar J, and the captain hosing down the deck. I couldn't remember what he actually looked like, so I sketched in his back, bent over, a watch cap on his head. Who's coming? I asked, but Josie had padded, pattered away down the hall with Henry following her. It's Monday, right? She called back. It is, I said, squiggling the pencil for shadow. 
The movie is closed. My cousin Beatrice comes on Mondays. She smiled. I forgot. You don't know that. Remember, Beatrice has a lingering cold? Ah, I thought. A lingering cold. Perfect for my next absent note. I looked around the kitchen. Not much to eat here. She came back into the kitchen. A thin line of red on her lips. Ah, but Beatrice brings dinner. Wait and see. It will be... She patted her lips together. Delicious? She frowned. Yes, but... Ah, I said, trying to guess. Stew? Pasta? Hero sandwiches? She shook her head. Delicious. I finished my drawing and propped it up on the counter to see what I thought about it. And then I heard the back door, Beatrice bustling in, her arms laden with bags and the smell. Chinese food, I told Josie. Of course, she said. That's what we always have. I put the plates out, the knives and the forks, and Josie ladled the food in bowls. Cashew chicken, mugu gai pan, bean curd. The smells make my mouth water. Beatrice stood in back of me. I looked over my shoulder. She was leaning over, her head tilted, looking at my picture. Did you draw this? I nodded. She took off her glasses and chewed on one stem. Surprising, isn't it? She asked Josie. More than that, Josie said, beaming and moving Henry off her chair before she sat down. As I reached for a shrimp roll, Beatrice slid into the seat opposite me and spooned rice onto my plate, the picture still in her hand. Don't eat, she said. I raised my eyebrows. Not yet. Trot out some more of your pictures, please. I went into Josie's peach living room with a lilac couch. We had tacked up a few of the pictures I'd done. Henry and the pelican, the rock jetties, Josie's thin tree figures in the back garden. I pulled out the tacks and brought the drawings into the kitchen. There was no room for them on the table, so I pulled up an extra chair and piled them on that. Now you can eat, Beatrice said, reaching for the top one. Thank you. I scooped up the chicken, piling as many cashews as I could on the spoon. She didn't eat, not until she had looked at all of them, holding each one up to the light. Josie kept nodding, reaching over with her fork to point at a line or a figure. And then Beatrice sat back. Imagine. I never saw anyone who was able to do this, she said. And I was an art teacher for 40 years. We taught that long, Josie said. 44 for you, Beatrice brushed at, at her hair. But did I ever once? No, neither did I, Josie smiled at me, reaching across to touch my wrist with one hand. Beatrice took a forkful of food, e eating absently, staring at me the whole time. We worked with all those kids who didn't have any concept of perspective, or even if they had that, the composition was all wrong. If you had only been in one of those classes, Hollis, she shook her head, then smiled at Josie. Never mind, she's here now. I couldn't swallow what was in my mouth. It was there in a lump, almost as large as the lump in my throat. Thank you, I managed to say. They were both looking at me, at the tears in my eyes. Spicy, that chicken, Beatrice said. I managed to nod, to chew, at last to swallow, thinking of the old man. Where'd you ever learn to do that? And Izzy, you have a gift, pure and simple. After dinner, Beatrice spread the pictures out on the table, reaching for my pad on the counter, one eyebrow raised to ask if she could have a piece of paper. With a twist of her pencil, she showed me how to deepen the shadow on the drawing of the sea. Well, do it on my drawing, I said. Never, she told me. It's your world. It belongs to you. She ran the pencil through her hair, separating the thick strands. Drawing is what you see of the world. Truly see. Yes, maybe, I said, not sure what she meant. And sometimes what you see is so deep in your head, you're not even sure of what you're seeing. But when it's down there on paper and you look at it, really look, you'll see the way things are. I frowned. Look at my picture one way and you'll see one thing, I said. Look again and you might see something else. That's what the old man, I shook my head. Uh, a friend of mine said that once. Ah, yes, Beatrice said, sketching in an eye. Bushy eyebrows, sharp lashes as she spoke. But that's the world, isn't it? You have to keep looking to find the truth. She ran one pinky finger over the eyebrow. The pencil smeared just enough to curve it upward, almost like a question mark. The other pinky softened the lashes. I watched her, fascinated. And something else she said, you, the artist, can't hide from the world because you're putting yourself down there too. I'm not hiding, I said, my eyes sliding away from her. She laughed. Good thing, because your soul is right there in front of you. She pointed to the sketch I'd drawn of Josie in her scarf. You see, it's what you think of her. She turned to Josie. 
Maybe I can take that trip now. Leave you in Hollis's hands. She loves you already. I could see that Josie didn't know what Beatrice meant. A trip? To the southwest, Josie nodded then. Yes, adobe houses, desert, flat rocks everywhere. I'll paint them all, Beatrice said. I looked from one to the other. Beatrice had picked up the pencil again, sketching herself, drawing a suitcase in her hand, and then she looked at me once more. You're going to be something, you and the language you speak on paper. She drew her other hand waving. I love what you have to say, Hollis Woods. I sat there, hardly breathing. You have that, she said. It's more than most people ever have. Count yourself lucky.